But we begin tonight with the growing threat of a regional war in the Middle East. Over the weekend, three U.S. service members were killed and more than 40 injured in an attack on a military base in northeast Jordan near the Syrian border. Late today, the Defense Department released the identities of the three U.S. Army Reserve soldiers who were killed. They are Sergeant William Jerome Rivers, Specialist Brianna Alexandria Moffitt, and Specialist Kennedy Ledon Sanders, all from Georgia. They are the first U.S. deaths in months of strikes by Iranian-backed militant groups since the Israel-Hamas war started in October. U.S. Central Command says the attack happened at a remote base on the border with Syria and Iraq called Tower 22. The White House is blaming an Iran-backed militia, with President Biden vowing that the U.S. will respond. Donald Trump, of course, pounced on the attack, portraying it as a consequence of Joe Biden's weakness and surrender. And the hawks in his party are pressing Biden to target Iran directly over the soldiers' deaths. Senator Tom Cotton, who, let's not forget, once advocated for the deployment of the military against Black Lives Matter protesters, released a statement about the Jordan attack, saying the only answer to these attacks must be devastating military retaliation against Iran's terrorist forces, both in Iran and across the Middle East. While Mitch McConnell said, quote, our enemies remain emboldened until, quote, the United States imposes serious crippling costs. Lindsey Graham was more candid, tweeting, hit Iran now, hit them hard. Some of the other usual suspects also weighed in. If there were ever a moment now when to show American determination and take uh, a significant step to reestablish deterrence, the president's response has to be to strike targets in Iran. We have to impose enough pain on Iran that it outweighs what they've done to us. First strike that hit, you punch and you punch back hard. What they should be doing is going after every ounce of production of those missiles. Wherever those missiles are, you take that out. The right's desire to bomb Iran is not new. But there's also a history, in fact, a bipartisan history, of American presidents sometimes choosing caution when it comes to engaging militarily in the region. That's not always the case, of course. Hello, George Bush and George W. Bush. But there are some significant historical reminders. Take President Ronald Reagan, who in 1982 sent U.S. Marines on a peacekeeping mission to Lebanon, a country rocked by civil war. The following year, a truck filled with explosives drove into the U.S. military compound near Beirut Airport and detonated, killing 241 service members, including 220 Marines. It was a military and political disaster for the new president, just two years into his first term. And yet, months later, Reagan announced that the Marines would withdraw offshore, a decision critics at the time said was a failure to stand firm against terrorism. More recently, in 2013, when the U.S. was roiled by the debate over how to respond to the Syrian government's use of chemical weapons in that country's civil war, an act the, that President Barack Obama had declared a red line beforehand, Obama nevertheless resisted, to the end, a military intervention in Syria. Ben Rhodes, Deputy National Security Advisor for President Obama, wrote about the red line crisis inside the White House. In describing a pivotal moment in the Oval Office, Rhodes wrote, quote, in the decade since 9-11, we'd gone to war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Somalia, and Libya. Now there was a demand that we go into Syria. Next, it would be Iran. It is too easy for a president to go to war, President Obama said. That quote from me in 2007, I agree with that guy. That's who I am. And sometimes the least obvious thing to do is the right thing. Joining me now is Ben Rhodes, former Deputy National Security Advisor for President Barack Obama and co-host of the Pod Save the World podcast, and Nayara Haq, a former State Department Senior Advisor and former White House Senior Director. Thank you both for being here. Ben, I will start with you. This drumbeat, once again, from some of the usual suspects, thinking Lindsey Graham, uh, in the wake of this ho horrible, um, uh, the horrible deaths of these three Army, U.S. Army members. Your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, there hasn't been a problem that Lindsey Graham hadn't identified the solution as bombing Iran uh, for a very long time in the Middle East. Um, I think if we step back from this, uh, there's some things we have to bear in mind. 
What has put our troops at risk is the escalation in the Middle East. Um, it's the escalation in the last three months, uh, obviously centered in the war in Gaza since October 7th, but also the violence we've seen across the region. And the deeper the United States gets itself into this kind of game of quicksand and tit for tat with these different proxies across the region, the more dangerous it's going to be for U.S. service members. Um, so if you're not going to de-escalate, what you're going to be doing is bringing more risk to the U.S. troops that are in that region and more risk that we're going to get even deeper into a regional war. And that leads to the Iran point. Uh, this isn't, I mean, it's not a video game. I mean, the way these people talk about these things, it's as if, you know, we're going to sit here in Washington and we're going to talk tough and then we're going to hit some stuff in the Middle East and there are not going to be any consequences. Uh, a war with Iran is a big piece of business. I don't think the American people are signed up for that. Uh, it could have huge consequences for inflaming an already inflamed region. It could lead to huge consequences for our service members, who are the ones uh, who are put at risk in the region. It could have huge consequences for the global economy uh, in terms of disruptions. If you think the disruptions in the Red Sea are difficult for supply lines, uh, wait until there's a full-scale war between the United States and Iran that engulfs the entire region. They're not even thinking this through at all. Uh, and I think right now you have to take a step back and realize that it's the pathway of escalation that has continually gotten us into trouble. Um, whether it was going into the war in Iraq without any kind of plan, uh, whether it was Donald Trump pulling out of an Iran nuclear deal that was working and escalating tensions with Iran, or whether it's kind of falling into this trap now where you have groups that are trying to pick a fight with the United States. I think when someone's trying to pick a fight with you, why would you give them exactly what they want? There are ways in which we can try to protect our service members and our presence in that region uh, without succumbing to this uh, you know, quicksand that is pulling us back into a war that I don't think the American people want either. Um, and so there has to be a place for diplomacy. There has to be a place to reject this kind of nonsense advice that we've been hearing for 20 years now. Joy, and it doesn't work. And let me just play just for to, to give you all sort of a flavor of this, of how this has sounded, because you're absolutely right, Ben. This drumbeat for war, specifically with Iran, which let's just be clear, ain't Iraq. And we couldn't get through that without, you know, we didn't really have a clear victory there and also managed to create ISIS in the process. Here is how people like Dick Cheney, the late John McCain and Tom Cotton have been over the years talking about Iran. My belief always was that we needed to keep the military option on the table. An old Beach Boy song, Bomb Iran, you know, <laughs> bomb, 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 bomb. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it would be something more along the lines of what President Clinton did in December 1998 during Operation Desert Fox. Several days of air and naval bombing against Iraq's weapons of mass destruction facilities. We likewise must work to collapse the Iranian regime that oppresses its people, and seeks to sow terror all over the world. Sink their navy, destroy their air force, and deliver a decisive blow to the Revolutionary Guard. In other words, neuter that regime. Easy for them to say, Nayara, they wouldn't have to do it themselves. Oh, well, let's just look at the fact that the faces that you showed of the service members who were killed in action, they're all black, and not a single person advocating in that video is a black person, and in fact, probably none of them would actually have been drafted or have to voluntarily serve in the military because of the military benefits of education and basic standard of living that you can get if you are the 40% of the military that is made up of people of color or the other rank and file members who are made up of people from lower socioeconomic classes. Our all volunteer military is amazing, but it also puts the burden of who has to serve out the chicken hawk policy recommendations. It's not the people who get to sit in those rooms and debate about whether or not the United States can go at it with Iran. There are so many other tools in the national security toolkit and the Republican party is out of not only the what is recommended by those who serve and, and the generals who command them, but they're also out of step with what their own, uh, their rank and file members would want. Nobody in the American public right now wants to see the United States involved in another 20 year forever war. I am gonna start with you, Congresswoman Crockett, because it is your state uh, that is home to the governor who has essentially dared the federal government to come down and enforce federal border policy. So it is portrayed, I just want you to confirm, as a, an absolute urgent crisis, no? 
Oh, absolutely. It's an invasion, Joy. It's an invasion, honey. So, yeah, we know that this is what they're saying out loud, but this is because people such as Chip Roy have made it very clear that they have nothing to campaign on. And so, therefore, they have found that this is their chance. They're able to use Democratic governors and Democratic senators, I'm sorry, um, mayors, to say, listen, everybody agrees, even the Democrats, right? And so here it is. We could have a solution, but we know that solutions is not what they want. All they want is rhetoric so that they can campaign. And, you know, Stuart, now you have Donald Trump saying, hey, blame me. Like, he wants the blame. He wants the credit, I guess you could call it, on the Republican side for killing a deal. And Republicans have responded in Oklahoma by literally censuring Senator Langford for doing nothing other than working on this bill. Your thoughts? Yeah, this is not a serious party. And, you know, what gets lost in all of this is sort of the scope of the human tragedy that's involved both on the border and in Ukraine. I mean, it's not an exaggeration that people are dying every hour because of this. It's not some theoretical game. It's not like debating the law of the sea treaty that's going to go into effect 20 years from now. This is like real stuff. And this is actually why you have a government and you hire, you <laughs> elect people to make tough decisions. And, you know, we have this massive budget. We have the largest military combined to the next nine largest military budgets in the world. We can afford to do both. This is a false charge, um, a false choice. And it's just really extraordinary for a lot of us who worked in the Republican Party to see what is de facto aiding and abetting Vladimir Putin uh, winning the largest uh, land war in Europe since World War II. And Congresswoman Crockett, so the Republicans are saying, they're saying that what they want is what they passed, H.R. 2, which would significantly restrict asylum. It would do remain in Mexico and some other things. It would defund the NGOs providing services to migrants, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The Senate bill, which is different from that, it, do you get the sense that, let's just say the Senate, for whatever reason, decided to do H.R. 2 and send that right back to the House. Would Republicans vote for that? No, absolutely not, because their leader has told them that they can't do it. You know, I thought that we lived in a country in which we had a democracy and we had three co-equal branches of government. But right now, it is clear that we have a leader over the legislative Republicans, and that leader isn't even an elected official. This is what we're dealing with. So when people want to blame Democrats when they head to the polls in November, the Republicans are saying that's exactly what we want you to do. But the reality is that Democrats have been the ones that have always been the adults in the room, especially this session, that have said, listen, we understand what it means to govern. That means that we don't necessarily get everything that we want, but we want to make sure that we are making some sort of progress and we're bettering the lives of American people. So we are always willing and ready to work. They are not. This is why this is the most unproductive Congress that we have had in modern day history. And I do want to pick up on a point that I don't think that we're we're emphasizing enough. This is the pro-Putin caucus. Full stop. That's what they are. And the fact that we have people that are agreeing to and allowing a dictator like Putin to do the things that are absolutely um, in opposition to democracy tells you how far we have come in this country. And it also tells you of the threat that we have in this country as it relates to democracy, because they are failing to respect the very principles that this country allegedly was built upon. You know, and Stuart, part of what they are now saying they are going to do, their proactive sort of action is to try to impeach uh, Homeland Security Secretary Mayorkas. They're going to do that. Um, but it, it seems that the Republican parties are sort of trapped between the two things they want most, right? Whatever Donald Trump wants, which is for Putin to win, and a border, the border to, I guess, I don't know, I, you know, to, to, to be the spark of a civil war. It's not clear if there's a policy they want other than Putin winning and, I guess, a civil war. Yeah, you know, we, we shouldn't forget that this was Donald Trump's main campaign issue when he ran for president the first time and was elected, and he failed. He failed on the border more than any president in history. You know, the wall that Mexico was going to build, all of this, that's the reason this is a Biden problem now, because yeah. Trump failed to address this problem. And, you know, what really is, is just so striking to, to a lot of us who worked in the Republican Party, the essence of living in a totalitarian society is you can't say what you know is true and what you believe because it's unacceptable. And if you held a gun to the head and a lie detector test to most of these Republicans, they would vote for Ukraine overwhelmingly.
and they would vote to do something about the border. But they're caught in this Orwellian world in which they can't tell the truth, they can't really be the people that they'd like to be, and instead, this is who they are. And it's a complete moral collapse of what it means to be an American. And, and Congresswoman, I, I mean, I think that's it's, it's hard to argue with that, Congresswoman. Have any of your colleagues on the other side explained why they didn't solve the border when they had what they claim was the greatest president in history and they had all three branches of government under their control? Absolutely not. But, you know, when it comes to policy, you're not getting very much policy out of the Republicans nowadays. And unfortunately, we end up in this cycle where it's a matter of, you know what, we will trust the Republicans because we think they're better on the, um, on the economy. We think they're better on border security. We think they're better on all these things. And then everything goes bad. And then they say, well, you know what, let's just go <laughs> ahead and see what the Democrats can do because we can't do any worse. And then the Democrats come in and and they clean it up. Right now, we have an economy that is thriving. I know that not everyone feels it at this exact moment, but by every metric, the economy is doing well. We are hitting record highs as it relates to the stock market. And so with that being said, trust Democrats. We will get it done for you. Yeah. And uh, Republicans will complain about it a lot, though. Congresswoman <laughs> Jasmine Crockett, they're good at that. Stuart Stevens, thank you very much.